<coughs> awesome. Okay, so YouTube started up, so let's start Digital Classroom. And there we are. I have to take a drink. I just uh, swallowed something, I think. Okay, today it's all about a little bit of magic in your shoots. Now we all know the problem, right? You have a beautiful model, you have a great set, but somehow there's something missing. There's something in your set that doesn't really compute right. It's when you look at your images, you go like, yeah, it's there. But there's still something that's a little bit missing. There's something that we want a little bit more attention to. So how do you do it? You can, of course, place extra lighting. You can, of course, do all kinds of crazy stuff with styling. But there's actually something a little bit easier. Now, of course, we all know that you can use backlighting, right? Accent lights, you can use color gels, you can use different modifiers. You can, you can do a lot of stuff. But in the end, it's all about creating a mood in your image. It's about creating a little bit of magic, just that little touch where people go like, hey, this is really cool. Now, I found over the years that when I started out with photography, <laughs> it was always different backdrops. So, for example, I said to Anne Week, let's take a purple backdrop. So I had a purple backdrop and I started playing with it and it was awesome. And then I wanted a yellow backdrop. And after the yellow backdrop, I had something like, you know what, let's do a blue backdrop. But in the end, every time you use a backdrop, I found out very quickly, it was like a gadget. It was something like, okay, let's do it. And then you took the shots, you were really happy, but then the next model came in and you go, ah, that same backdrop. So that's when I stopped, stopped using Seamless and I started using custom backgrounds, like for example, in our studio, paint the walls or use wallpaper or click pro backdrops or lasto light. You can have many different backdrops. <laughs> The only problem with different backdrops is, one, they're expensive, and two, they are still the same. Now, of course, we use a lot of click prop backdrops, which are awesome. You can use them in different ways. They're pretty wide, so you can choose different positions where you shoot it. But in the end, it's still the same backdrop. So I was thinking about why not do something that's different every single time, but it's still the same. So you can get a sort of a signature look. You know what you have to do in Photoshop. Retouching is easy, but I still want it different every time. And we started using smoke. A at first, by the way, we started using bubbles, which didn't make any sense. It just looked weird. So as soon as we started using smoke, there was something that came in the images that was really, really interesting. So why is smoke interesting? Smoke prevails not only atmosphere, but also movement, because the smoke moves around. But smoke also works as a diffuser, it works as, as a blocker, it works as a mood maker. There's so many different ways about smoke that is interesting. So today we have our model Claudia and what we want to do is we want to set up first a shot like, okay, let's just take a shot of a model against a black backdrop. So no backdrop at all, just black. And let's see what happens. After that we're going to start adding some accent lights, just normal accent lights and maybe some color in the accent lights, I don't know yet. And after that, we're gonna add that final ingredient, smoke. Now you might wonder like, hey Frank, is this gonna be really intense? No, today it's just gonna have a little bit of fun with our model and with smoke. But I just wanted to show you guys what you can do with smoke. So if you think like today we're gonna use light meters and color checkers, Yes, we're going to use those, of course, but we're going to keep it relatively simple. And the reason for this is very simple to explain. In most cases, if you do something that's really, really difficult, and you have to think about technique, you have to think about a lot of stuff. But if you do something that already looks great and gives you images that really makes your heart pump, you will find out that during the photo shoot, your images will just flow like easy. The model sees the image, oh, wow, that looks great. Your client sees the images, wow, that's amazing. And you just go like, yeah, this is awesome. So you don't have to try so hard to create something that's interesting. <laughs> so for today, smoke and mirrors. No, that was another workshop. Today we have Claudia and we're going to do something with smoke, but first we're going to set it up the easy way. Now, Anna Week fell down again. <laughs> Sorry, Anna Week. So when we change cameras, it, it's a little bit more relaxed than normally. So I'm already going to set everything up for picture in picture so you guys can see the studio. 
And on the top right side, sometimes during the workshop, don't worry if you see a no signal. It will be back in about one or two seconds. Uh, we have the iPad connected. Uh, we have a great dock at the moment. It works like a charm, but I'm also beaming it towards the monitor so I can actually see the images coming in. And because we're using a Chromecast for that, it sometimes very, very slightly loses the connection to HDMI. So not a real problem, but so you know, if it happens, that's the reason. <laughs> so what am I using? At the moment you see a big screen and that's actually an iPad Pro and we've connected our Sony A7R4 with an USB-C Tether Tools cable, uh, 10 meters at the moment, uh, and it's a booster cable and the USB-C cable, right? No, this is only the USB-C yeah, and the booster. Yeah, so we have a USB-C booster cable and the USB and USB-C, and that means that we have a total line of USB-C. So there's no connector, uh, converters, nothing. It's USB-C to USB-C. And that makes it actually pretty fast. I, I always, when I used it on the PC, I didn't really see a difference between the USB 2 transfers and the USB-C transfers. And I think that was mainly also because of the operating system. Because now on the iPad Pro, we started out with our old cable on USB 2, and the images came in pretty fast. But as soon as we switched over to USB-C, the iPad Pro is blazingly fast. So I think it's also due to the operating system. So if you're shooting on an, uh, iPad Pro, just imagine faster with USB-C. Okay, um, we have our split screen at the moment. I'm gonna give the mic not to Enewik because I have the mic on me, but that sounds nice, right? Give the mic to somebody. So let's switch over to our studio and which is the Frank Cam on a week? I think camera three, right? One. Camera one. No. Camera one? Yeah, the new cable from Tentals. Switch to camera one. Okay, so in a week, be careful, don't fall. Huh? Don't make it a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> Claudia, if you can please walk on the set. Now for the first setup, I'm not gonna do anything really difficult. I, I just wanna show you guys what you can do. So we have one strip light from Hensel. I'll come a little bit closer, one and a half meters distance still. We have one strip light from Hensel and the thing that I always do with my lighting is we're using honeycomb grids. So that's a grid, and what it does, it really channels the light towards my model. So I want a really narrow beam of light, and as soon as we start to smoke, I'm actually going to explain to you guys why. Okay, let's start, just very simple, just turn on the light. Let's look at our model. Looks awesome. Do you like the light? Yeah! <laughs> awesome, right? Okay, let's turn it down a little bit. I'm going to grab the light meter. I promised you guys we're going to use that. Now, of course, a light meter is not something that you need for photography. It just makes life so much easier. So let's just start with a very, very simple setup. So we're going to hold it in front of the area I want correctly lit. 2.84. That's a little bit on the low side. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That should be F4. And that's F4. Awesome. So how does that work? On the light meter, I saw 2.84. Now... On the remote control of the Hensel, and that also goes for Ellingrom, Profoto, and other big brands, you can actually set up the strobes by one tenth of an f-stop. So if I see 2.86 and I want to go to f4, I just go up that amount of clicks. You can also go to 4.5 or whatever you want, but I always go to the full f-stops. It's easier. Is there any problem, Anavik? No. Okay, awesome. Okay, so let's pick up the camera. F4 ISO 100. Make sure that you also type that into the camera. So I'm now on ISO 1000. Let's switch that back. And if you see a tail in the image, it's not me, it's the dog. I hope. Okay, F4, 125th. Okay, let's see. Can look a little bit that way. Very, very simple shot. Nothing really that interesting yet. But as you can see, there's already something there, a little bit of mood. And this is because I'm using my light from the side. The other thing that you actually see is that on the other side, it's really, really dark. So in a moment, we're gonna add some extra lighting there. But for now, let's keep it this way. Okay, look a little bit more down and keep your hands. There we go. See, it's a nice boxer outfit. Not boxer, but boxer. You know what I mean, right? Okay, so now when I look at the shots, I go like, mm, interesting, cool, nice. Little little arrogant girl, little, a little bit fashion-y, I don't know. It, it looks great. 
but I'm still missing something. So let's add some lighting from the back. Now with lighting from the back, you have to be careful. With lighting from the back gives you that three dimensionality in your images if you use it correctly. Now in the Netherlands we have a saying called tang verlichting. That's actually lighting coming from two sides in an equal amount. That's something that overall isn't regarded as very nice. It's something that actually looks a little bit terrible. So although I'm using that kind of lighting, I am using it under a different angle. So normally when the model is here and you have two lights coming from the side, that doesn't look right. What I'm doing is one light from here and one light all the way from the back. So let's just turn that on for now. And what I want to do is I just want to enhance the side of her face a little bit to give it what a little bit of size and a little bit of oomph. Let's turn on the modeling light. And there we go. <laughs> Great. Okay. Also here there's a honeycomb grid in because I really want that focused light today. So and we no um, problems there. No, there's awesome. Hi. Just look that way. Well, say hi to the people. Okay, so now that we aim that light a little bit towards our model, we already see that effect in there. It's getting better, right? But it's a little bit hot on the side of her face. So what can we do about that? Well, as you can see here, you also see that those hairs really jump out. And that's because I'm using a rather, well, harsh quality of light. So normally, when I use light from the sides, I will actually use a soft quality of light. But because we're using smoke in a moment, I am using a harder quality of light. So how am I going to solve that if I only have reflectors like this and I don't want those hairs to be like that really nasty jumping out? Well, I can feather the light. So let's first do that. That's a little bit of a trick that's really awesome even if you don't use smoke. I'm going to take out the grid. So now I have way more spread in my light. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually not going to aim it at my model, but I'm actually going to aim it at Brian, our cameraman and my son. And I'm going to turn it even a little bit higher. Now you might wonder, Frank, why don't you meter that backlighting? Because you're always meter. Yes, I always meter, but there's one thing with backlighting. Every model is different. Sometimes you have a dark skinned model, or you have a fair skinned model, or you have a, a yellow model, or a blue model, or whatever, which country you're from, maybe a green model. And everything reflects differently. Blonde hair reflects differently from dark hair. So with accent lighting, I'm always a little bit like cooking. A little bit more, a little bit less, but I do it on the eyes. Or on, you know what I mean, right? I just look at it. Now, this is also one of the reasons we shoot tethered, because I want to see that coming in right away. Okay, so I did meter it, I did feather it, so I moved it away from my model. And let's see what happens. There you go. Now you can already see that those hairs are a little bit softer. There's still some hair sticking out, but it's softer. You also see that we have way more latitude now with our uh, strobes, right? We see a lot more. Now, when I see this, I go like, huh, let's add a little bit more mood. Why shouldn't we just take that strobe, place it closer to our model. Normally the light would be softer now, so let's see if that really happens. And I'm aiming it at my model so I can see everything on my model. And then I just move it away. So this is the bright spot. This is a little bit softer already, softer, softer, softer. And now it's totally gone. So I'm just going to aim it slightly back. There we go. And we're going to turn up the volume, the power. So even more power now, and it's closer, so it should burn out completely, right? Let's see. And it does. Exactly as expected, right? So now what we do is we take a look at the left side of the frame. Do you see that nice flare, that nice glow? That's actually lens flare. Now on my camera I have a special lens called the black mist filter, and that enhances that lens flare a little bit. So let's first take use of that lens flare. So let's take that strobe, move it all the way to the front, almost in front of my model, aim it, aim it back, and now aim it towards the camera. So I'm shooting from a low angle. There we go. I didn't change the output yet, but I did move it forward and feathered it even better. So let's see what happens now. Go to F4. So way more lens flare. 
And now I'm actually seeing what I want. Now I have to adjust it to my liking. So I'm gonna turn it all the way down. But this is the nice way of the lens flare, or sorry, of the feathering. Let's turn it down. Cool. And let's take the shot. There we go. And now when I move around, I can actually get a little bit more or a little bit less of that flaring. Now we do have some junk in the back that you see, but are you a boxer? Yeah. Oh, then I have to be careful. <laughs> I better retouch you correctly. Okay, you do see some stuff in the back that I don't like, but hey, that's no problem at all, because we're just testing now. I think this angle works best, so look that way. So now we're gonna take some serious shots. Nice, love it. Awesome. Okay, cool. But, as you know, it's not really wow yet. You do see, by the way, do you see that the hairs don't blow out anymore? That's that feathering. So I'm actually getting a boatload of light, but the model only gets a little bit. And that's because in the center, the light is the brightest, but also the harshest. On the side, the light is softer and also less powerful. So that's how we get a very, very nice accent light, almost like a softbox and we still get that lens flare because all that light is hitting my camera. And that's what a lot of people do wrong when they start with lens flares. They move the light all the way to the back like I started and they, they just can't get that hair to not blow out. That's the trick. Move the light almost next to the model, aim it towards the camera and then just aim it a little bit back so only the side really hits the model. But again, eh, not interesting. Let's add some color. And color, as you know, evokes emotion. And I hope the right emotion. Hey. Let's add a nice blue gel. Do you like blue? Yes. I hope so, because that's the one that's here. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, a gel always takes away a little bit of light, so let's add half a stop extra. Just to counteract, I don't know exactly, but I think those are like half a stop. Okay. Yeah. Nice, love it. Okay, now let's make it a little bit more interesting. Can you put on the hood? Yes, there we go. Nice. Awesome. And of course with a wide angle lens we can do some funky stuff. Can you hit me on the lens? Keep it that way. For example, you can do something like this, if you like that. It's, in this case, the light isn't really set up for this, so it doesn't make any sense, but hey, I just wanted to throw that in. Nice, love it. Let's change the angle just slightly for myself. There, love it. Nice. Okay, so, by the way, do you see how fast these images come in? This is a 60 megapixel raw file. So it's not like a JPEG you see, it's the raw file. It just looks great. I'm totally in love with it. So if you also use an iPad Pro, find Cascable online. It's really, really good. Okay, let's change the light a little bit. Like, let's make it more dramatic. So let's move that to the side. Let's aim it up and angle it all the way down. Now I should re-meter, but for now I'm not going to do it. Let's call it lazy. Okay, just look that way. There we go. It will not be a huge difference, but just a little bit more dangerous. There we go, I love this. Okay, so let's say that you really like what you're seeing, but it's a little bit on the dark side for you. So what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Right, open up the strobes. Yes, but no. If you open up the strobe in the front, you will actually take away that magic that you see now, that really dark and that moody look. So although it looks pretty obvious, okay, I have too little light on the front, let's open up the front light. Don't. The only thing I'm missing at the moment is actually her hand. Do you see that when she does this? It falls a little bit out of the light. Look how the light is set up. This is the cool thing about the strip light. You can literally just move it. Okay, so. We didn't change anything on the face. Watch this. I'm just gonna open up that one a lot. 
Uh, it's now 5.6, let's go for 8. And that's not an f-stop, and just move it a little bit closer towards my lens. Okay, so instead of opening the main light, I actually opened up the accent light. And now, as you can see, it opens it up really nicely. And I still get that nice atmosphere in my shots. It's almost like an Instagram filter. Instant Instagram. There we go. Looks pretty cool. Okay. But, as I already explained to you guys, we're going to do something with smoke today. Because although lens flares are cool, you can still see the backdrop. And sometimes you shoot in a location where the backdrop really sucks. It's a really bad backdrop, you don't really like it, so how can you hide your backdrop? With smoke. So let's start our smoke. Uh, Brian, are you ready? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to move the lights back again. <laughs> Not too far, but just a little bit. I'm going to aim it back at my model. I'll turn it down again to five. Okay, there we go. Are you ready, Brian? So, there are a few things you have to realize with smoke. First of all, the smoke machines have to warm up. And they already did. But the other thing is also that smoke works as a diffuser, but also as a mood maker, but also as a reflector. So, although this image looks great, and I didn't change a lot, I only moved the light further away, so let's see how it looks now without the smoke. So, without the smoke, we have this. This is a pretty cool and moody picture. But realize that as soon as the smoke comes in, you will also see that her face just opens up a little bit more. So, how is that possible? Because the smoke also comes in front of the model, it also reflects the light back from the blue. So, that means if you have the blue too harsh, it will actually register in the face as blue. We don't want that. We want a little bit of blue in the face, that's no problem, but we don't want a lot there. So this is why the model is really close to the strip light. So the whites will actually don't... Let me rephrase that. The model is really close to the strip light, because the more smoke is between the model and the strip light, the more I will lose my opinion to shoot. Think about when you drive a car in the fog. If you turn on the headlights, you will see a white bank. We don't want that. So first of all, smoke, we light it from the back, and the front light is as close as possible to our model, that there isn't a chance of a lot of smoke in between. Okay, Brian, can you fill up the back? We have two smoke machines, so that should work. Yes, a little bit up. Okay, so we only did the back now. Let's take a look, and as you can see, yeah, it's okay, but it looks fake as can be. Now, how is that possible? This is something that a lot of people do, and I also started out that way. What I'm doing is I'm actually... And we can you please... What I'm actually doing is that I'm, at the moment, I'm only using the backdrop. Now, when I started out with using smoke, I did exactly the same thing, because you're thinking about this. We have a backdrop, we have our smoke, and we have our model. You don't, don't think like that. The first thing you do is you put all the smoke in the back, and then, a little bit of smoke in the front. So, Brian, can you first fill up the back? Uh, nice and thick. Okay, and now as soon as you're ready, one little puff in the front. There we go. Now, of course, at one point there will be too much smoke in front of the face. But just keep shooting. You always have the dehaze filter. There we go, now it looks nice. Now she's really in the smoke, as you can see. Okay, Brian, a little bit in the back. Yeah, they're both up again. Uh, they have to warm up? Yes. Okay, no problem. We still have a lot of smoke. Okay, there we go. Okay, so that's one port. But as you can see here, we still have that big gaping hole on the right. We have smoke on the left, we have a gaping hole on the right. And this is why ha, we already have another strobe there. And this one we actually use a grid on. And I'm going to aim this directly at my model. But from the side. So let's see what happens now. So don't feather it. Leather it, whatever. Don't feather it, just tether it. Yeah, yeah. 
We gaan eerst even met het wit. Ja. Oké, okay, there we go. Awesome. Oké, okay, Brian, are the smoke machines ready? Oké, okay, look a little bit that way. Oké, okay, awesome, love it. Oké, okay, just smoke in the back. Awesome, there we go. One, two, yes. Nice. But of course, if you shoot with smoke, and you shoot with colors, and you have blue on one side, you should have red on the other, right? We just love reds. So let's just go for red. And of course, we have that already done. So let's pick it up. Ooh, that's a really small one. Let's do the bigger one. Are you having fun? No. Me too. Okay. Let's build this up. Okay, so now we have red on this was this one all. Let's turn it up again. Okay, so now we have blue and red. And white. Ha. That's the Dutch flag, of course. Nice, love it. Okay, Brian, let's give some smoke. Nice, and a little bit in the front. Love it. There we go, that's what I need. Love it. Okay, let's wait for the smoke to clear up just a little bit. Awesome. Okay, this is one port, but let's be honest. Yeah, it's nice, but it's not something where I go like, whoa. It's more like I go like, wow. But I want to go, whoa. I, I really want to be mesmerized by the shots. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to make sure that I see the strobes. So let's place them a little bit closer towards my model. And let's make it like a rock concert where you can literally see the lights around your subject and it just looks awesome. So let's up the awesomeness. Okay, there's a question. Why do photographers always use red and blue? Ha! Let me ask, that's Ineke. Uh, no, Mark Ah, okay. I will explain in a moment. Okay, so now we have both strokes in the image, which I really always like. There's a little bit of hotness coming from one side. Oh, it's... Uh... There we go. Okay, Brian, a lot of smoke behind the model. And a little bit in front. Oh, that's nice. I love it. Wait for the focus. Yeah, go, one to go. Nice. I'm coming a little bit closer, a little bit more white. There we go, love this. A little bit lower, quite angle. Nice. Oh, sorry. One, two, go. I don't see, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I can do it like this. I don't know if that's nice, but, ooh, that is nice. You never know what's happening, right? Mm -hmm. Now, Maybe you can change into something a little bit more unless comfortable. Okay. Yes? Okay, the, our model is going to change, and in between I'm going to explain that question that you have. So I'm going to switch over to... Oh, can I switch over on a week now, or yeah. is that a problem? Are you okay? Yes. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to my camera. Um, let me see. Camera one. Camera four, actually. Okay, so the question was, um, let me see. It was on Facebook. Oh, it was on Facebook. Why do photographers use red and blue gels? So why do photographers use red and blue gels? I don't know if all photographers do it. I know I do it. And the reason is actually very, very simple to explain. Let's just start by white. It's white, right? It's just white. So that's out of the question. Yellow. Yellow is very, very close to white. So that means that if you shoot with a, jello, uh, a yellow gel, 
it will look like you didn't do your color balance right. It looks like a golden hue, but it's a nasty golden hue. It's like, hey man, just use a color checker. Let's make that image right. Let's go for green. Now, if I ask you guys, like, the first thing that comes in your mind when I say green. Okay, I hear somebody going sick. Yes. Throwing up. Yes. Easter. No, that's purple. Um, Irish. Green. Safe. Green. But I think it goes not much further than those images. And let's be honest, if you say throw up and being sick, it's not really a color I want in there. Now let's go for red. Love, hate, power, strong, uh, hot, warm, uh, atmospheric, Christmas, um, danger, right? A lot more emotions. Now let's go for blue. I'm feeling cold. Uh, it's distance. It's really, really harsh. It's the future. It's like, like you're walking in nighttime. So with blue, you also get a lot of emotions there, which you miss with the other colors. Now let's go for purple. Purple is actually a color that would work very, very well for the very simple reason. It's very close to blue and it's in the middle between red and blue. That's where purple lies. So in essence, that's a really cool color. Now why doesn't green work? Well, why doesn't yellow work? Yellow is actually between red and green. So yellow is in between that green. So cyan, for example, why doesn't cyan work? Cyan is between blue and green again, so also towards the green. So you find out that in a lot of my work, and a lot of other photographers also, that color green is actually a little bit avoided. Now I'm not going to say that you can't take great pictures with green. We already did a few and they looked awesome. But it's, it's really something, if you just throw in blue and white, uh, sorry, blue and red, it always looks nice. If you throw in green, you really have to think about what do I want? Do I want this? Do I want that? Is that really what I want to preserve to my viewers? And that's actually why we do that. Now somebody says orange. Orange is possible because orange is very, very close to red, but it's also very close to yellow. So again, yellow goes towards the green. So in essence, everything that's close to blue and close to red and magenta is in the middle of those two. So that actually works like a charm, but everything that's close to that red and blue, that will work fine. At least that's my opinion, but what do I know, right? It's all about taste. It's all about what you like. Maybe you like green and you're a big fan of green, just do green. But you find also in art, like for example, look online for Caravaggio, the painter. It's a lot of red accents that you can really see jumping out. So let me just feed the dog very quickly because he's angry, I believe. It's because of the smoke. Oh, it's because of the he's smoke. He's afraid there's something... Uh, you like the smoke. It's, it's a dog. He likes smoke. Fire, right? Oh, and just to be sure that you guys see him, look there. Chewy, look. Oh, other side. Say hi. Hello? Nee, niet naar de snoepjes. He sees the candy and he's my friend. Okay, so anyway, ow. <laughs> now I only have two fingers left. Just kidding. Okay, any more questions before we go on to you? No? Uh, let me see. No, no more questions. You have a question. What do you want to know, Chewie? When is daddy coming home? I don't know. Okay, let's continue. Oh, and by the way, uh, this is also very cool to show you guys. If you use Cast Cable with uh, the Sony or any other camera, you of course see the images big screen, but look at this. Even when I zoom in on my iPad, now let's just not uh, push my luck. There we go. You can also see that you can zoom in on the preview. So that makes teaching a lot easier because at that point I can literally just show people, hey, look at this detail here and just move that around. So I really like this software. And in between, we can also give it stars. Of course, if I really like that shot, I can give it stars or I can edit. So really cool software and highly recommend it. This is what I meant. Sometimes you see the no signal and then it goes back again. Okay, let's um, continue. Um, and in this case, are you ready? Yeah. I see you have big gloves mm -hmm. and it's not that cold here. So, if you stand on your place again, my English is very good, <laughs> but the rest does come nog wel. Okay, so anyway, that was a little Dutch joke. So, let me first just take a cool shot with the gloves. Okay, so on both pictures, 
There we go. Okay, so now without the smoke, as you can see, it looks okay, but it's not that interesting. So Brian, we want a lot of smoke again. And I'm not done yet, so don't worry. We're gonna make it a way more interesting. Yeah, yeah, to look. Yeah. Okay. So first only smoke on the back, as you can see. Eh. Okay, smoke on the front, Brian. Uh, smoke on the front, sorry. Yes, there we go. Love it. Nice. Okay, but as you can see, I'm missing a little bit of light on the gloves now, so I'm, I am gonna adjust my lighting. So I'm just gonna move this a little bit this way. And because see now has gloves, I have to do that, because I love those gloves. Nice. Hit me. Okay, Brian, a little bit of smoke in front. Ooh, that's a nice one. Okay, wait for the smoke to come up. A little bit more smoke here, Brian. Nice. That's what I mean. Huh? How do you With the camera. Oh, but is it hard with smoke yes. Okay, let me repeat the questions because Anna Week is not using a microphone. Uh, how do I focus? And I said as a joke, with the camera. Logical, right? Now, how do I focus? I focus with the camera, of course, but I focus in between the smoke. So I already have my focus. If you, if you listen carefully, you can actually hear the beep. So as soon as I nail the focus, I will ask Brian, okay, can you give me a little bit of smoke? And at that point, I already have my focus locked. I only have to wait for the smoke to come in and the model to stand still. And that's actually a problem we have now. We're shooting on F4, which is pretty low. Or did I already go to F5? Yes. So that's pretty low. And at this point, I'm pretty sure that I nailed her eyes, but if she moves a little bit forward or backward, that can actually mean that she's out of focus. So if you're not comfortable, the best thing you can do, if you don't want to change too much, is actually, for example, go to, well, let's go for F11. And then ISO 400. And F11. If I calculated correct, by the way. Yes, I did. And now I have way more depth of field. Okay, Brian, a lot of smoke. On the back, or the front? back and front. Love it. Nice. There we go. Okay, so. It's okay. Do you have another shirt? By accident. Yes. By accident you have. Oh my. She already told me. So I'm going to change this. I'm going to change my light a little bit. And we're going to do something a little bit more interesting. A lot more interesting, but also a lot more dangerous. Because I have a little tool on my other strobe, and it's called an... Do you know it already? Yes. It's the light blaster. I will help you. Okay, so I'm going to move that behind my model because I don't want it in the frame. Maybe, I don't know yet. And I have a lens on there and it's like a gobo uh, projector. But a very affordable one. So let's just turn that on for now. You have to make sure that you turn off the modeling lights because otherwise it will melt. There's a lot of heat. Now, let's first just turn it on and see what I have. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, it's on full power. <laughs> Love the shirt, totally different. Okay, so I changed the light a little bit, and now I have the light blaster in the back. Now, I didn't change the output of the light blaster yet, so I don't know what the quality is, but let's see. Oh, that looks okay. Love it. Okay, Brian, a lot of smoke. And especially uh, on top. So. Yeah, yeah. Looks awesome. Nice. Okay, now as you can see, because there's so much smoke, I'm already losing my light blaster a little bit from the back, and I'm losing my focus. There we go. So, 
the light blaster from the back is now hardly visible anymore. And it's already on full power. So what do you do if you want that light blaster to be visible totally? You can always tune down the rest of your strobes. So let's do that for now. So I already know that this one has more than enough power and this is my main light. It's now 5.7. Let's go to 4.7, that's one stop. 3.7, that's two stops. And let's go all the way down. So almost three stops. I'm going to do the same for this. Also three stops down. Oh, you can't go three stops down anymore. Okay, no problem. And this one can. Okay, great. And I'm going to open up on the camera. And now the light blaster should get a lot more power, which should be awesome, right? Let's see. Yes. Nice. A little bit more uh, smoke, Brian. And especially in the front. Nice. This is without the smoke and more and more smoke is coming in as you can see. Love it. Nice. So I like the way that the backdrop now reacts. You see all those little uh, lines from the light blast and that's because now we have a gobo in there that actually shows you lines. You also have them with hearts and whatnot more. But let's see if we can fine tune this even more because I don't really need those blue and red lights really in the frame now. So let's move those back and let's see if we can add a little bit more oomph to that light blaster. So let's only use these as accents on the model. So move them further away. Really nice. And let's go all the way here. And let's turn it down also a little bit. Light blaster is looking great from here. But let's just move that up. There we go. Let's aim that at our model. There we go. Okay. Let's first try it with a little bit of smoke. And I also want more light on the gloves. So I am going to still move this light more to the front. Just open it up a little bit. Okay, let's see if we now can get something cooler from the light blaster. Yes, love it. Okay, so now if I choose to choose my, um, how do you say that? Now if I choose to get my angle a little bit lower, I can get that really nice over the top effect. But if I keep my camera a little bit lower itself, I will get this. So I can choose very quickly between this or this. And this is a very powerful trick because sometimes it's really cool if you see that light coming from the side and sometimes it's really, really ugly. So it really depends on what you want in your shot. But remember, if you set it up like this, you always have that choice by just going up or down. And that's really handy. Okay, let's open this up even more. So let's just go down. Let's go for ISO 800. Let's see how far we can push this. Okay, there we go. Okay, correct lighting. Okay, Brian, a lot of smoke in the back. But especially on top. There we go. Love it. Okay. And a little bit in the front. Nice. No, the back didn't fire. There we go. So you can see I'm choosing between yes or no, that backdrop. Ooh, sorry, I was a little bit too late. Keep it that way. Love it. Yes. Nice. Okay, let's keep that. Nice. Let's come a little bit closer. Let's make it even more dangerous. I'm a little bit too fast, right? Okay, final ones. There we go. Now, if I shoot really fast, the light blaster doesn't recycle, so I can always choose in between, like, okay, maybe some with the light blaster, some without. I really like the effect of the light blaster here, but I think now it's time to do something really cool. Let's move those lights all the way to the side and keep the light blaster where it is. And let's create some little bit more 
blue tints on their gloves. Brian, can you take? Okay, there's a question. Yeah, I already explained that one. I'm not going to do that again. Okay, sorry. I just explained it in like 10 minutes. Oh. About yellow. Yes, I always explained yellow because it's near to green. Just rewind after the broadcast and there's a whole explanation about the colors like five minutes ago. Okay. So now I'm using them all the way from the side and I only want to give some accents to the gloves. So. Let's see if we can figure that out. Now there's a lot of LED lighting here. Normally, of course, the studio is pitch dark. And at that point you can literally see what you're doing. So this is a little bit, well, winging it. Now normally, of course, we want those blue and reds in the back. For the very simple reason, you want to backlight smoke. But at the moment we have that light blast in the back that already gives a lot of light. So we don't really need that. So let's see if this works. I probably have to adjust it a little bit, but let's see. Okay, it looks actually pretty cool already. There we go. And with the lower angle. Yeah, I love this. Okay, smoke, Brian. I always told you not to smoke, right? Mm -hmm. And now you can. Try to be a good dad. Nice. Love it. I think Chewie also likes it. Okay, Brian a little bit on the front with the smoke. A lot more on the front. The other smoke machine. We always use two. Yes, there we go. Keep it that way. Love it. Nice. Awesome. And without the light blaster, one or two. There we go. This is too much, I think. Let's just move it a little. Yeah, I love this one. So I'm just letting it creep through. When I'm looking at my live view, I can barely see the light blaster from the side. There we go. Now you get that really nice over the top glow. Just want to blow it out just a little bit on the side. So this is without. This is with her face in front, and then when I move just a little bit from the side, this is too much. Let's take it a little bit. There we go. Love it. And I have to make sure that it's behind my model, so with these kind of poses, sorry. Okay, let me see. I'm just trying to figure out what I like. Oh, this, this I really like. Okay, Brian, a lot of uh, smoke in the front. Okay, just wait. Brian a little bit higher the smoke around her gloves. There we go. Don't try to suffocate my model. Awesome, love it. Nice. Okay, Claudia, can you turn around please? And when I say yes, turn around very violently and try to hit me. One, two, go. Okay. Slightly lower. One, two, go. And one, two, go. And again. One, two, go. And again. Are you ready? One, two, go. There. Now, that little bit of action. Do you see now that the smoke also moves around my model, creates that look? I actually love this stuff. So, let me see. If you turn around, can you just try to hit it low? Like, aim for my you-know-what. Yeah. Don't hit it. I know we will be angry if you do. Okay, step one step that way. That's too much information. Okay, are you ready? One, two, go. Ooh. And again. One, two, go. There we go. That's the one that I wanted. Look at that. Okay, now scream with it. Like you're really hitting me. One, two, go. There we go, look at that. Is it weird that I'm scared? And a week, are you there? Do you see what happens? We only have a backdrop. We use, of course, that light blaster, but we use that red and blue from the sides, and that gives that little bit of X on the gloves. Do you see that it really jumps out? In my opinion, we need a little bit more blue. 
You love it? Yeah. Cool. Hey, um, Claudia, how, how are you um, feeling about making your head really wet? That when you turn it, we see all the, the water droplets fly. Yeah. Yeah, can you do that? I Don't you mind? I guess so. Okay, make it, make it really wet. Uh oh. We're gonna do a wet look. Anemiek, are there any more questions? Yes. Oh. Uh, if you don't have a light blaster, can you create a beam of light with a snoot? Okay. If you don't have a light blaster, can you create a similar mood with, for example, a snoot? Why do I feel like that rhymes? Anyway, no. And yes. You can create a beam of light with a snoot without any problems at all. The only thing is, if, if you see here, you see that there are all these lines. And that's actually because you can also focus a light blaster. And I didn't do that yet. But let me just try that very quickly for now. So I'm going to focus it. That's... Okay, let me see. It's an M42 lens, so it should be that way indeed. So I'm just going to shoot it now. There's no model, but let me just show you how those lines look. Okay, so this is more out of focus lines. So it, it looks okay. Let's just refocus this. Let's just see what we like more. I have to be really careful that my lens doesn't fall off. Because with M42, it's a, a screw mount, and let me put it this way, it's not a really good fit. <laughs> but it works. Normally, they're designed to use Canon lenses. See, now it's more softer, which I personally, no, I like the other one better. So, and this is something that you can't do with a snoot or any other device. Let's find something in the middle. There we go. And of course we also have hearts, we have, I don't know, a fence or... You can do a lot of stuff with gobos. Okay, I like this better. Yeah. Way better. Any more questions on the week? Okay, so I'm gonna take a... I'm gonna take a drink very quickly. And then... We're going to continue. So let's just give you guys a little bit of a uh, trailer for Patreon. And we'll be back in two and a half minutes. Hey guys, and welcome to our studio in Amaloid. My name is Frank Doroff, and today I want to talk to you guys about something that we get a lot of questions about. Hey Frank, how do you like this image? Hey Frank, what can I improve in this image? And of course, I love to help you guys out. But online, I mostly am limited to just saying, hey, I really like it, or continue like this, or change this. I, I can only do short images because, let's be honest, we get so many questions. So that's what actually got us thinking. And we started a Patreon. Now, what is a Patreon? Well, let me put it this way. Do you want an extensive photo critique every month? Do you want the bed phone where well, you can directly contact me with any questions you have? Do you want to be a member of a group that's closed off on Facebook that have the same interest as you guys? That isn't about putting people down, but it's actually about helping people progress in their photography and retouching. Well, that's our Patreon. Now, by joining our Patreon, every month you can deliver one or two images. We're not that strict about it. And I will do a whole video. In that video, I will show you how I would do the retouching, what I would change about the shot, and I give you a whole lot of tips. That video is put online on a closed off website, and it means that only the guys from Patreon can see that video and help you out. So I help you out, and the whole community helps you out. It's just an awesome way to learn. So if you like what we do, of course, the first thing you can do is subscribe to our channels, leave comments, and smash that like button because we really like it and tell other people about it. But if you want to do a little bit more and help us out creating the awesome programs you enjoy, like Behind the Closed Doors, Digital Classroom, quite frankly, our upcoming podcast, Beyond Photography with the Doorhoffs, and a lot more, then please join our Patreon. I already know you're absolutely gonna love it. So head on over to the link below and start joining our awesome group on Patreon and get a lot of benefits. Thank you so very much for supporting our work. See you online.
Okay, and we are back, I think. Okay, um, so we made our model really wet. Hmm. Um, doesn't have to be rhythmic. <laughs> oh, echt, hè? Okay, well, let's first take a look at how it looks when you're wet. Oh, this looks so awesome. Okay, take some shots. Oh, let me see why the light blaster doesn't fire. There we go. Okay, turn around if you want. And then as soon as I say yes, turn around very violently. One, two, go. Okay, one, two, go. Let me zoom out a little bit. One, two, go. Okay, zoom out a little bit more. One, two, go. There we go. One, two, go. And now really hit me. Like, uh, extend your arm. One, two, go. Okay, that was my fault. One, two, go. Oh, wow, look at that one. Now, with the light blast, I'm not going to kid you guys. This is really difficult because if I place it slightly wrong, it will just blow out completely. But if I nail it like here, you really get that nice effect. And I hope that by moving it around, as soon as we start adding a little bit of smoke again, that you really get that nice look. So, Brian, are you ready? Are you cold? No. That's a shame. <laughs> one step that way. Perfect. One step that way. Yes, that's perfect. Okay, Brian, a lot of smoke behind her. Let's first just take some shots with smoke. These are not really great shots, don't worry. Okay, now a little bit in front, Brian. Okay, now turn around. The model, of course. One, two, go! One, two, go! Okay, let me move a little bit to the side. One, two, go! And scream. One, two, go! Oh, that's my fault. As I said, it's very difficult to do. One, two, go! There we go! Nice. Now let's turn the light blaster down just a notch. And let's see if we can get some nice over the top glow effects. I'm going to go to three stops down on the light blaster. <laughs> I think that should be great. Okay. Let's see if this looks. Oh, wait a minute for the light blaster. Oh, that's cool. Okay, uh, Brian, a lot of smoke behind her. And up. And just a puff in front. And you turn around. And when I say yes, you're gonna kill me. One, two, go. Nice, because now I can use the light blaster in the screen. One, two, go. One, two, go. One, two, go. And the final one. One, two, go. Nice. Thank you so very much. You rock. You're awesome. I'm not going to shake your hand. Okay, so let me go behind the computer. Awesomeness. And let's switch over to my camera. There we go. Okay, so I still have my images up here, so let me just go back to my images. And let's close this. Now let's go from the start. Now, as you can see, there's nothing wrong with images like this. Uh, for the very simple reason, it's a great portrait, right? But if you go through and you can see that we're already building some mood here. Like for example, you can make your model look away which looks pretty awesome in my opinion, but you can also make her look your way, which gives a totally different vibe to that image. Now, as soon as we started adding that backlighting, this is actually what I meant. Do you see that there's a lot of like nasty stray hairs that really look harsh? Well, as soon as you start moving your light to the sides, you will see that although you still see the stray hairs, it looks a lot better. It's, it's not that really harsh quality anymore. We did some overblowing here. And look at this, super, super soft quality of light, 
but still lens flare. And that's the cool thing about using light sources like that. You can move them around and by using the angles, you control how much softness you have in the light. So compare this oh, sorry, to again this one. Look at that, how nasty that is. And that's everything that I didn't like about model photography when I started out. Everybody said you need hair lights and I was like, hair lights, okay, great. So I started using hair lights and I saw stuff like this and I was going like, this can't be what people mean by using hair lights because it looks ugly, it looks terrible. All those hairs are going everywhere, it looks harsh, it looks like it's, it's almost artificial. So as soon as I started using soft light, that's where I started to see stuff like this where I went like, ooh, but that looks nice because now the hairs still jump out, but I don't need to Photoshop them. Do you see the difference? Here I don't need to Photoshop them because they don't draw my attention like hey, here I am. It's literally something like, okay, great, it's there. Okay, so we started with some backlighting, as you can see here, some cool shots, and it's more the expression of the model, and of course if she really knows how to box, it's even better, and I think she does. So we started adding blue. Now as soon as you start adding blue, you see that we are getting atmosphere in the shot. It's getting more interesting, especially for me. Now as soon as you put on the hood, that's where you get that really dark mood. So as soon as I start retouching those images, they will be a lot darker. And of course, different poses, just try out stuff. And it doesn't really matter if you see, uh, did he eat all the candy? Then he's gonna be sick on a week, don't. I think he knows when uh, he's barking he gets a candy. Yeah, but don't teach him that. <laughs> As you can see here, this is what I really like. This is that really moody look. This is what, for me, transforms an image towards something where I go like, yeah, wow. I you don't need to light the eyes always. You don't need catch lights every single shot, guys. Come on. Sometimes it's really cool to have the dark eyes. And this is not a model shot. This is a shot of a sporter. This is a shot of somebody that prefaces a certain look. And it's not a model shot. This is not Claudia, this is a boxer, right? And when I shoot Claudia, I want to capture her character. When I shoot a fighter, I want to shoot the fight. The fight that's inside and not the beautiful model. Because in this case, she's not a beautiful model. She's a fighter, so you have to adjust yourself. And with the lighting, I already tried it by making it more moody. Giving it a little bit more overexposed look here with the blue. As you can see, because I'm streaming, it takes a little while to build up the previews. I really like that shot. And this is where we started adding the smoke. Now as soon as you see without the smoke, it's okay. But as soon as you start adding the smoke, it really helps. But there's only smoke on one side. And this is one of the tricks. If you use smoke, there can be a lot of smoke on the right side of this frame, on that side, but you don't see it. And why don't you see it? If you don't backlight smoke, you won't see the smoke. It just doesn't register on the camera. You, you can see some like, hey, what's there? Let's, let me see, what's that? But it doesn't really jump out as, ooh, that's amazing, that smoke. That's when you start backlighting the smoke. So that's why at one point we stopped doing one light, and of course in the front of the model. But I started adding that second light. So let's just move forward a little bit. And these shots aren't bad, but you have, let me put it this way, you have a certain balance in a shot. And in this case, I want the balance, for example, to be on the left side. So that means that if somebody looks at the image, it's really hard to look another way. Let me see if I can quickly show you something that's really interesting. So when we look at a shot like this, we're Westerners, right? We read from top left to bottom right. So that means if there's a really interesting part on the bottom left, we can't really leave that image. That's why my logo is always on the bottom left and it's red, so it really draws your attention. So watch this. If I switch this over, you will immediately see that somehow it doesn't look right, right? It's it's okay, but it doesn't have that okay, it doesn't have that oomph factor. And as soon as I turn it back again, for me, this is more balanced, also the way that she moves. Now, the other way is also nice, but then she should have twisted slightly the other way. I hope you, you guys get what I mean. Okay, let's see if when we started adding that second light. First, the white light. There we go. And then we started adding a little bit of an accent light. As you remember, we started adding red. And for me, in all honesty, now everything falls together a little bit more. I'm now starting to see a little bit more color. I start to see a little bit more mood in my images. 
So it starts to look something a little bit more interesting. Now, of course, clothing is everything. A hood is cool, but sometimes when you fight and you have your gloves on, you don't need a hood, right? So at that point, I took a lot of shots. Oh, this is where we actually started putting the lights in. So let's go further. Now, you can also experiment with this. This is a very, very low angle. Maybe Brian can uh, take Chewie out for a second, yeah. Annemiek, because this is not going right. So by choosing a very, very low angle, it's not something that you would normally do. It's not like, oh, let's shoot a very low angle. But I don't remember when the point was when it happened, but at one point I was just so bored with just shooting from eye angles and shooting from an eye angle. So I started shooting from a lower angle and that made the model already look bigger. But this was more like shooting from here to here. And I'm already a tall guy, I'm almost two meters high. So for me, eye level was actually looking down at my model. So I was already from a lower angle shooting up. And then at one point I thought, you know what? I'm always shooting with that 70 to 200. Why not go for the 24 to 70 and just put it on 24 and shoot from a lower angle? And that's when everything started to click in my head. From, Ooh, that looks really interesting. The only problem is you saw the ceiling. And we have an, um, how do you call that? A ceiling with different plates. You know what I mean, right? And that's really, really difficult to clone out in Photoshop. So I thought, how, how can I solve this? Smoke. And this is actually where I started using smoke way more, just to blow the smoke up. And at that point, you literally don't see the ceiling anymore, you only see the lighting, as you can see here, and it just works like a charm. Okay, so lower angles, also cool. If I would have known it worked better, I would have took a few more. Here you can see that she has the gloves, but there's not enough light on the gloves for me in these images. I go like, it's nice from the back, but the, the gloves are too dark. I hope you agree with me. So let's just go further. I think this is the part where we actually moved the strip light because I now have more light on her uh, gloves, but it's still not enough for me. So let's go further forward. Do you like the shots, Claudia? Yeah. Okay. This is where we started adding the, um, the light blast. And as you can see, from the back it works like a charm, but still the sides are a little bit too dark for my opinion. So this is where at one point, let me see if we can fast forward this a little bit so you guys don't see every image. We started adding actually those lights to the side. And that's where for me everything started to fall together and worked. So this is with the strip light more on the front, but you can see that the, the accent lights are still in the back and somehow it works, but it, it, it doesn't really work for me. So let's go to the final shots. And of course we also did some close-ups. Let me see where we started adding them. To the there we go. This is where we started adding them to the sides. And this is for me really where it started to work, where I, where I really got the feeling from, okay, this is nice. This is also, and this is the thing that happens in a photo shoot when something works, you start to experiment more. So at this point I also started to do, oh, what now if I take the light blaster and I move a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right? Oh, to the right it blocks the light blaster so you only see the beams. If I go to that side it really wraps around that effect. Awesome, let's do that. So that's where I started to do in front and it's okay, but it's, Let's be honest, it's a little bit boring, right? When I look at this, wow. And don't worry, in Lightroom, if you just tone down your highlights just a little bit, maybe even here, let me see if we have an option here for highlights. I believe we do. Uh, let's see, plus and minus. I believe this is highlights, yes. Yeah, and in this software it doesn't really work the way that it does in Lightroom. In Lightroom this will clean it up a lot. Uh, at least, you know what I mean. Okay, let's just go for the images at the end. Uh, let's just close and let's just go for those. Let's just work our way back. Okay, so at one point I was thinking like, okay, so I really like the shots she's doing at the moment, but I want to get something like this for example where you really see that she's screaming, she has all the power in there, she really goes for it, she dives in. You go like, yeah, why not? So let's zoom in. Yeah, look at that. Wow, it's almost like Sylvester Stallone. Don't know if that's a compliment, but it's meant as a compliment. Look at the motion in here. 
And of course, a lot of these shots you can throw away because they don't look nice, but you only need one. Claudia is looking, no, I want more. You will get more, don't worry. Let me see which one I like most. I love that one too. There we go with the motion. That's too much. Oh, nice. Love it. This, this is the one. Now, for me, this one just hits it on the head. This one is awesome for me. And somehow, I don't know why, but this really appeals to me in the power. So I, I will probably crop it a little bit more aggressively from the top. Let's probably do it a little bit like this. So people really get the idea so straight in front of you. Now, let me explain that. If I do this, you can see that she's further away, right? She's at a safe distance. But in these kinds of images, don't you just want them to be straight in your face, straight on? So, make it look like you couldn't step further away. Make it look like, wow, she's so close, she can't even fit in the camera. Do you see the difference? This is something that's straight in your face. You're almost afraid of it. Maybe give it a little bit more. There we go. Way better than, for example, this. I don't know. And the, you know the cool thing is, Anna Week is now sitting behind me. When I show Anna Week images, I always talk about crops. And somehow, every time she's on the internet and she goes on Facebook, she comes to me, Frank, I don't like this crop, am I right? And I just go like, yes, yes, you're right. The crop isn't right. So even somebody that isn't a photographer, that isn't trained as a photographer, that doesn't shoot any images except with her iPhone, as soon as I point out all those tips in Digital Classroom about cropping and during the workshops with cropping, even somebody that isn't a photographer starts to see in all the images, I don't like to crop. And sometimes I just test in a week out, like, okay, how would you have cropped it? And she nails it every single time. You know why? Cropping isn't hard. Look with your eyes. Don't look with your photographer's eyes. Because your photographer's eyes will tell you, oh, I see the top of her face, so it's great. No, look with your eyes. Look at how an image perceives you. So when I zoom in, is this more powerful? Heck yeah, this is way more powerful. So why not crop it? Yeah, but Frank, a part of her arm is falling away. Yes, that's how close he was. Look at this. Isn't this scary, this close? Or is this scary? No. So when you take a picture of a fighter or a sporter or a motocrosser, make sure that it doesn't fill the frame with space. No, it fills the frame with your subject because it's so close and you get the idea, right? Okay, let's see some uh, questions. If you don't have a light blast, can you create a beam of light with the smooth? I already answered that one. Or put smoothing with a pinhole in front of the smooth. Something, I think you mean, Enneke. Uh, yes, if you have a gobo, you could put it in front of your snoot. You think it doesn't work. So let me show you why it doesn't work. For that, I have to pick up the light blaster. So one moment, guys. I'm going to walk towards the light blaster. I'm going to take it off. I'm going to show you guys. Let me first turn off the strobe and let's take the light blaster off. Okay, there we go. Bye bye. Are you happy with the results, Claudia? Thank you. Awesome, me too. Love them. Okay, so here we have the light blaster. Let me switch over to full screen. And by the way, so if you guys in the chat can let me know if you like these shots, I would love to hear your opinion. Okay. And by the way, if you like the light blast, I have really good news for you. As you know, we love TerraTools, and TerraTools actually acquired the company that creates the light blaster. So from now on, TerraTools is the official owner of light blasters. So that means that you can buy these from your TerraTools dealer. And you know who that is in the Netherlands, right? Almost every camera store or our store. Okay, so what is the light blast? Now, as you can see here, I have it on a reflector. <laughs> let me just move it here. And this is one of the Hensel reflectors. So let me just show you how it looks. So I'm going to open this up. And I'm going to open this up. Now, I have, to be sh <laughs> I have to tell you guys that mine looks like it was in a war. And it's a little bit handicapped because I didn't read the manual. You should always read the manual, RTFM, right? Read the freaking manual. So I was having a lot of fun with my modeling lights, just showing to everybody how cool the light blaster was, until I found out that there's a lot of heat coming off, so my light blaster now literally is fried. So it doesn't fit right anymore, but it still works, so that doesn't really matter. 
Okay, let me take it off. Okay, first things first. Now, the light blaster is a gobo projector. So that means it needs a lot of light. But when you look at your strobe, you will see that there's a modeling light and there's a little bit of a round thing. We call that the flash tube. Now, the flash tube in a normal reflector reflects everywhere. Now, look at this. We don't need light to go everywhere. We need light to go in here. And everything that's not going in there, we lose. So that means if you use a normal reflector, you will lose a lot of light. And that's also, by the way, why you use this on your strobes. Now, if you use a speed light, you don't need it. On the speed light, you just place the speed light, you take this off and you place the speed light in here. And you get even a lot more power than with my studio strobes, because everything from the light goes straight in. On the studio strobes, we use this and the bag, so no light is spilled. But you can get a lot more power out of it by just thinking about how does a reflector work. This is a, a reflector with a deep throat, as you can see here. So that means that this reflector already focuses the light forwards. So the normal reflectors are like this and a little bit wider, so you lose a lot of light. This one already in the studio gives me two stops more than an original uh, reflector. So also on the lens that will give me way more light. And that's the main problem with the light blaster. It eats light. So you need powerful strobes and you need powerful reflectors. So how does this work? Now, when you look at the front, you can see that we actually have a so-called M42 converter. And that's this one. So normally you can mount Canon mount lenses straight on. And then it's a very, very tight fit. You don't have to worry about it falling off. That's only with this converter. So you put your Canon lens on here. Now the reason I'm using M42 is actually out of poorness. I'm <laughs> just kidding with you guys. The thing is that this, of course, reflects the light forward. Now, every lens you put in front of it is a lens that has a certain, um, how do you call it, uh, millimeters. So you have a 50 mil, you have a 24 mil, 70 mil, 200. And all those lenses will create a different angle of view. You know this, right? If you use a 700 mil, you can get a bird really, really small, really big on your sensor. If you use a 12 mil, that bird will probably just be one pixel wide. This is something that you have to realize for your light blaster. If you want a really nice spread out of your light blaster around your model, you will have to use a wider lens. So in this case, I'm using a, f uh, what is it, a 44, I believe, uh, Helios. Yes, 44. And there's something else. So with the 44, I get a nice spread, with the 24 even more, and I would love to have a 24 on uh, M42. So if anybody out there has a 24 2.8, think about me. So this is the Helios. There's something else that you have to realize. Now, I'm using the M42 lenses for a very simple reason. Look at this. When you look through, you see the aperture, right? The aperture is now wide open. Watch this. If I close this, uh, sorry, wrong one. Let me see. I need the top one. There we go. So when I close this, you can see that the aperture closes down. Let me see if you can see that. Yes. So now I locked it on f4, 2.8 f4, but I can also lock it, of course, on, let's say, f16. Now watch this. Yes? And this is really important. If you use lenses, for example, I believe Nikon has some lenses that you put in front of the light blaster, and it will always default to f22. And that's because you need a little pin that actually says to the aperture, open up. Don't close down. And this is why I use the M42 lenses, because most of the time the apertures are stuck. And I mean stuck with literally stuck. And at that point you can literally just put it in front of it and it's always wide open or as closed as you want. And because this one also has a locking mechanism, I literally trust interns. Because this one you can impossibly, if I lock it here, I can turn whatever I want and the aperture goes up and down. But if I lock it the other way, so let's just lock it on F2. Hear that? I can't move the aperture ring anymore. I can focus, and this is where Ineke's question comes in. Can I use anything in front of my strobe, for example, a snoot? No. And the reason for this is very simple. The reason we're using a lens is because we need to focus. And if you put something straight in front of your snoot, just try it out at home. 
Take your snoot, put something straight in front of it. The only thing that will happen is you take out light. It doesn't really register. Now think about the classical masters, right? We have a video about that, all about uh, edge transfers and shadow transfers. If you have your light here and your model here, and you place something really close to the light, it doesn't really register, it just makes the light darker. And you get a really edgy transfer, but it's, it's really, really long. Now, as soon as you move the gobo all the way here, or in our case, the flex, you get a more distinct shadow line. So if you would use a snoot and a gobo, you should literally take the snoot all the way to the back, like 10 meters away, and place the gobo like maybe one meter in front of the model. At that point, you will see some stripes, but you still don't have to control like focusing your beam like you saw me doing. You can literally just focus it. So if you buy lenses for this, these lenses retail for maybe 50 euros. So that's way cheaper than a Canon 24 2.0, right? I would love that lens for this. And you can experiment with different lenses. So this is a 44.2, we also have 35 2.8, and they all give a little bit of a different character. So with M42, just a very, very cheap way. And hey, we're Dutch, right? Okay, let me see, we have some more. Oh, and oh, by the way, <laughs> I do have to make the image complete. Here we have the Gobo. So this is what I take out. So this is the one that you saw. So we have a lot of different ones, but the cool thing is you can also use slides. So if you have still a box with old uh, slides from your grandpa or from your own, I still shoot slides. You can also use those in here and you can, for example, project a whole um, forest behind your model. I, I hardly do that, but they do have a really cool one with an old science fiction like scene. Like from the movie, uh, what was the movie called that uh, Queen used? Met Met Metropolis. So you have like a scene from Metropolis and that's really cool to project, for example, behind the model and then just play with it. Most of all, I will use these, for example, with glamour shoots to really create some cool stuff on your model or with smoke to create stuff in the smoke. But we're using these a lot lately. So I really highly advise you guys getting one if you want more creative stuff. Yes, Annemiek, you have a question. There's a question on Facebook. Okay, um, question on Facebook. The, from Sylvia, she shot with her smoke last uh, workshop. Yes. And she asked, uh, she, had, she did have problems with uh, reflections. Okay, smoke and reflections, that's the big thing. It's the same when you drive a car. If you drive a car and you open up your lights, the smoke will literally reflect back all that light and make the smoke white. You don't want that. That's why you saw me using the strip light from the side and not from the front. I'm shooting from the front. The strip light was from the side. And the more I moved it towards the front for the gloves, you saw that the image became less interesting. So I started moving it back again and started moving those red and blue gels in the front to light more of the stuff that I was missing. The reason is very simple. Smoke from the side and from the back, especially from the back, works like a charm. From the front, it's terrible, it doesn't work at all. So never use light from the front. It also means during a workshop, if you smoke, don't move in the same angle as your lighting. Now normally during workshops, I always tell people, walk around your model, shoot with the light, shoot against the light. With smoke, hardly ever shoot with the light because it will reflect back. Again, that's also the reason why the light was so close to our model, for the very simple reason. If it's this far away, we can have this amount of smoke in between. If it's this far away, we only have this amount of smoke, so I can shoot more and more intense. Oh, we have a lot of questions here. Um, there's, there's one question on, oh, one on, question on That's a guy, uh, Davey, he uses purple and pink all the time as, a, uh, as gels. If you use purple and pink all the time, awesome, go for it. You know guys, and I really mean this from the bottom of my heart, everything I say is my opinion. It's only my opinion. If you're smart, you listen to what I say and you just determine for your own what you want. If you like pink, use pink. If it works in your shots, there's no problem at all. Personally, I don't like yellow, but think about this, a hotel room, lingerie session, maybe a glamour session, and you use yellow to create that nice golden glow. Why not? Works like a charm there. But with fashion shots, I find yellow a little bit too strong to be neutral and it's too soft to be a color. And that's my opinion. Uh, blue and red, those really jump out and for me that works. But pink, purple, why not? If it works, it works. So don't worry about that. Uh, let me see. Um, I have to go unfortunately. Thank you very much for the awesome presentation. Super interesting. I have a lot of new information to keep up. Okay, great. Oh, that was Davey. I think Davey also said it on uh, Facebook. 
Uh, Joe's photography, I love my light blast. I even make it my own slides with transparent paper. Um, Joe, that's really cool that you say this. Um, please contact me via email because we're still thinking about creating some custom gobos, but I can't find anything that can create a really narrow beam of light that will fit in the light blast and that doesn't crumble because I need something that like a re really small beam of light, if you know what I mean, right? Like almost like a Zorro mask. So we're still looking for materials. Maybe somebody with a 3D printer is up for the task to print something for us. So please contact me via email and we can work something out probably. Okay, um, now this was a little bit of a shorter digital classroom because with smoke, uh, first of all, the whole room is now filled up with smoke, so it's really hard to shoot. And the model had a really specific outfit, so we didn't have time to change that over. But overall, I, I think you enjoyed it a lot, I hope. Okay, now we got a lot of questions about Cascable, so I do want to show you a little bit about Cascable in between. And let me just go here. Now, I already did a video on Cascable, but I still wanted to show it here because so many guys have questions about it. So, how does it work? Um, let me just grab the camera. Let me see if I don't lose any connections. There we go. So, what you see in the back, you see, of course, Anna Week. But, let me see if I can There's see this. wrong with my hands. <laughs> so, this is the... Um, you know what? If I showed you Cascable, I will just disconnect it so you can see it. Okay, so, you now see Cascable in. What I really like about this software is, first of all, of course, it works with my camera. But look at this. You see that my iPad is charging on top and you see that my camera is charging. So that means that when I'm on location and I have power and I don't need a lot of power, I only need a USB-C charger, I can charge my camera and I can charge my iPad. So I never have to worry about any problems with power. And this is where Tether Tools has these really cool battery packs. So this is one of those battery packs. So when we take this on location, I can charge my iPad and I can charge my camera. Now, of course, these will run out, but they also have very powerful ones that can keep it up for a full day. Now, here you're going, ooh, full day, do I need a battery pack? This is the reason why I wanted to shoot on the iPad Pro, because even when we start out with, I believe it was 70%, I did a whole workshop, including my camera, and I ended up, I believe, with 10% left. So the iPad Pro really has a big battery. But if you're like me, really paranoid about power and you just don't want to think about it, charge everything, that works. Thanks to Cascable. The other thing that I really like is a lot of the times when you shoot on an iPad Pro or when you work on an iPad Pro, they use a so-called sandbox and that annoys the heck out of me. I'm a Windows user and I also use Mac. And at this mo point, literally, I'm using 99% Macs. But there's one thing that I f find so frustrating about Apple is they always close stuff up on the iPad Pro. It's a professional device, open it up. So that means that if you shoot to your iPad Pro, you can't get the images off really easily. And this is where Cascable really has a really cool thing. Do you see this tethering? So what you can do is you can create links, as you can see here on the bottom, create a link. So that means that Cascable doesn't store the files in the sandbox, but you can literally give a link to a folder on your iPad. Or, yes, watch this. We have something like this from Lassie, a really small SSD drive. This is a two terabyte drive, and on the back of my iPad, I have a little bit of Velcro. And also here, I have a little bit of Velcro. So as soon as I'm on location, I will literally just take the hard drive, and click it on my iPad. Small USB-C cable, I'm ready to shoot. And at that point, it will literally copy all the files on my hard drive, so I don't have to worry about my iPad getting full or whatever. And as soon as I'm done, I will take the drive off, as you can hear, and at that point, I can go to my computer or whatever I want and empty the drive. Really, really well thought of. Okay. And of course, you can use your camera settings like live view, you can do all other stuff. And this is something for our landscape photographers. You have a neutral density filter where you can literally say, okay, I have a neutral density filter of 12 stops. What is my initial shutter speed? One, 250, so now I need 15 seconds. Awesome, <laughs> really, that kind of stuff. Or sharp stars. What is your focal length? I'm gonna shoot this with a um, 12 mil or 11, 12. <laughs> 
And what is my sensor size? Well, I have a full frame sensor, of course. So my maximum shutter speed, if I want sharp stars, is 50 seconds. Now you might wonder why is this important. Did you ever try to shoot the stars and you see those little star trails? Now the cool thing is if you see the long star trails, that's awesome. But if you want to shoot stars and you see it just a little bit, that's really annoying. And that's because the earth rotates and your camera doesn't, right? So your camera is fixed. So with this calculator, you can very quickly see, okay, if I keep it under 50 seconds, the Earth's rotation doesn't register on the image. Now watch this. With 12 mil, you have 50 seconds. But as soon as you go to, for example, let's say you want to photograph the moon, 200 mil. Ooh, now I only have three seconds. This might seem like, hey, it isn't interesting, for us model photographers it isn't, but I just think it's cool that they have it in the software. Now of course we have the map module where you can see where we are and where all your shots are. This is another thing that I really like. My camera doesn't have GPS on board. Cascable will inject the GPS information into the file. So that means that when I'm on location, I can literally see, okay, this shot was taken in this castle on the back or whatever. So I can always find that back. That was really, really nice. And of course we have the recipe editor where you can put all the recipes in yourself. Okay, let me switch over and show you the hub that we're using because we also got a lot of questions about that one. So I tried my best to find one that worked and that was very, very hard to be honest. I thought it would be easy, but it was actually hard. We now have, how many of these hubs do we have? Five, Five or six? six? <laughs> I should to return them. So what is important when you buy a hub for, for example, Cascable or any other software that you want to add to your iPad Pro? The first thing of course is card readers. Yeah, why not? Card reader, always handy to empty your cards on your iPad Pro if you have a mobile workflow like I do. Network, don't think that it's not important. It's really important. VGA, not really important, but it, it's on this one. And I decided to take this one because Believe it or not, when we did our workshops in South Africa, there were still projectors that used VGA. So at that point, I could have connected this one. At that point over there, I was very lucky that I had an Apple with me because they had a converter for that one. If I had a Windows machine, I literally didn't work. The most important thing for me is HDMI because I want to be able during workshops and during my own photo shoots to be able to see the images on the screen, right? And of course, at the moment we're using a Chromecast, so that means that while we're doing Digital Classroom, it's hooked up to the HDMI to our computer, and I'm using Chromecast to see it on the big screen in the studio. But the most important thing, and this is what a lot of those docs don't support, so this is why I'm showing you this. You see those two USB-C connectors? It doesn't focus on it, let me move it up so you don't see my face anymore. Okay. Those are very important. Now often you have one and you go like, yay, so now I can connect my camera. This one goes into the iPad. I can connect my camera and I can shoot. And it works. You need the second one to charge your iPad. Because let me put it this way. If I start a workshop and I find out that my iPad is only at 10% and I don't have the charging port, I can't do my workshop. So make sure you have a charging point. And this is where the final tip comes in. This one has two USB-C controllers, but one is actually a charging port. I believe it's called PD. Make sure if you buy one of these that you buy one that has a charging port because if it doesn't have a charging port you have two USB-C ports but you can't charge your iPad. So these are I believe 70 euros on Amazon and this is an I don't know how to pronounce it something and this one works like a charm, but in America you can buy these. So you have to find something with a different brand, but they looked exactly the same. So just look for the 14 in one, I believe it's called. But do make sure you have two USB-Cs. Okay, that's about it. Let me see if there's any other questions. No, are there questions on Facebook? No. Okay, then I would like to thank you so very much for watching and Yes. Next week we have a webinar for Photo Wow. Yes, next week we have it's a webinar uh, for Photo Wow indeed. Um, register only. Yeah, so look on our social media, we're going to announce that. And our book, of course, The Magic of the Speedlight. Yes, we have our ESPN numbers, we have our Amazon numbers, and I'm in the final stages of checking the book. So uh, uh, a lot of our friends from America did do the translation uh, together with Anna Week. 
And in all honesty, when you read it, it looks fine, but it didn't really sound like me anymore. So that's why I'm now introducing a lot of mistakes in the book, like different sentences and whatever, which doesn't make any sense, to make it a little bit more me. So when you read it and you think about the Dutch accent, you can literally see that it's me. And I'm now at page 60, I believe, from 167. So I think in about one or two weeks, you will find the book online as an ebook and as a print book even. So we have both. Paperback. A paperback. Any more, Annemiek, that you want to share with our friends? No. No? Then I would like to thank you so very much for watching. If you like what we do, subscribe to our channel, leave comments below, smash that like button, and hit the bell notification button. And Annemiek is saying bye-bye. <laughs> bye-bye. <laughs> See you again next time. Bye, guys.